Rock. The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bill, season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. And man, Chris, it's all right here at our fingertips. I feel like this is it. I feel like this is our first real, like, this is a season that started with very small expectations. Can I say that and not be offensive? Yeah. Okay. So when I say something like that to open a podcast and I say three weeks ago, I had no expectations about what we could be, what we might be. I then have to take a look at where we are today. And we are the three and oh Buffalo Bills heading to Baltimore to play a Ravens team that is kind of caught some bad breaks. I mean, they're just a couple bounces away from being three and oh like us. Yeah. It's a handful of plays. Or what, oh and three? Yeah. They just as easily could be oh and three. So with that in mind, it's crazy what's at stake and what's in front of us. And that brings us to our week four preview, the Buffalo Bills against the Baltimore Ravens. Now, Chris, the time, 8.05? Right, because this is baseball. What's the time? 8.20, you idiot. 8.20? 8.20, NBC. What am I supposed to do for the extra 15 minutes? Collinsworth. On oh, the my God. Everyone's favorite. You know, I get excited about these things, and then you tell me Chris Collinsworth's there. It's like anti-Viagra. It's like if you handed me the opposite of... I wonder, Chris, you know how they say, like, hey, if you take Viagra and you have an erection that lasts longer than four hours, you should seek medical assistance. I wonder if they just played those people highlights of Chris Collinsworth calling Kansas City Chiefs games, if that wouldn't fix it for everybody. Yeah, that's, they also, should, that's guys, also possible. If you're a doctor, let's talk. Sean, Sorocky, yeah. you're out there. Listen, this is homeopathic medicine. Oh, my God. The place, M&T Bank Stadium, the line, the Buffalo Bills are two and a half point underdogs. It's the Ravens plus two and a half. Now, Chris, this is a weird dynamic. I heard that it used to be that three points just went to the home team by default, right? That is correct. Then Ryan Lacell informed me this week that teams, the home teams have just been getting one and a half early on this season, kind of on a regular basis. I haven't studied... uh NFL lines that much because you know I'm I bet college college is my betting game which I did win a hundred bucks last week betting college football you're welcome Alan Eck is the official never heard of him I don't know if I like that yeah especially with the last name Eck. Eck. it sounds like the noise that I'm, I'm gonna make when they call us for a legal procedure nine times in a makeup effort for what happened to the uh, Ravens during the matchup with the Chiefs. <laughs> oh, that guy's not lined up on the line of scrimmage. And they flag us nine times for it. Heck. Uh, injuries of note, the Buffalo Bills will, in fact, be out, uh, be missing Teron Johnson and Terrell Bernard. They've already ruled them out for this game. And Chris, there's a petty part of me that almost wonders if Sean McDermott didn't make a mistake by not putting Terrell or uh, Teron Johnson on IR immediately following week one. Yeah, it's uh, odd. Well, McDermott said that they looked at it and it didn't seem uh, likely that they needed to go that route on IR, which is weird. I would have assumed he like broke his forearm or something or had some type of bad sprain on his forearm with Taylor Rapp crushing his arm yeah taylor rap the the infamous taylor rap you know and then obviously big loss in a game like this not having your starting middle linebacker in the game it's not great you know but, but the good news is those are the only two that missed practice other than tylen grable who only played because we were throttling and when I say throttling, I mean a th- two hands around it, throttling the Jacksonville Jaguars. So Tylen Grable is a depth loss, but we have guys from the practice squad will call up. I'm sure it, it'll be fine. Kyrie Lynn was limited with a neck. I'm sure he'll be fine. Kirk, Chris, what did he do? He he sprained his neck watching Christian Benford run down the field covering a, a Jaguars wide receiver. And he was like, why couldn't I do that last year? <laughs> yeah. He's like, wait, you can cover those guys? <gasps> no, sorry. That's that's me being mean, but also we're petty. It doesn't matter. 
The Ravens, on the other hand, have a lot of shit going on. It's the only way to frame this properly. So Jalen Armour Davis, one of the uh, cornerback that our guest tonight is not a huge fan of, but I can't wait for him to tell you all about it. He mispracticed with a hamstring. Also, center Tyler Linderbaum with a knee injury. Tackle Patrick McCarry with a neck injury. Nose tackle Michael Pierce with a shoulder. And guard Andrew Voorhees. Now, those are some giant chunks of the Ravens' offensive approach, Chris, isn't it? Yeah. Everybody might remember what happened to the uh, the uh, Ravens in that playoff game against the Bills where they lost their starting center and put in a backup, and he immediately got his quarterback, what, two snaps over his head and then immediately got him knocked unconscious? Yeah. And they had to put in a backup to end the game? Yeah. Yeah. Also limited participation, Roquan Smith with an ankle. And other starting guard, Daniel Falele, w- he was he has a hip injury. I think that some of these are interesting, right? Like, a your whole offensive line didn't participate in practice <laughs> for a day this week. All of these Baltimore injuries are far more concerning than that of the Buffalo Bills, and they're going to require watching ahead of this game because it could play a massive role. If they're all healthy, then yeah, this thing lines up to be a gunfight. If they're not. This thing could degenerate very quickly for the Ravens offense. When you think about what's at stake, you know, the thing we opened the show talking about, Chris, three weeks ago, I was kind of convincing myself that I would have been happy with just, hey, let's let the chips fall where they may. This team might be mediocre and it's okay. It's okay because you're a Buffalo Bills team that we know what you did. You ate, you ate your, you took your medicine, you ate. 65, Chris, is that still the number? 65 million in dead cap? I'll look it up in spell track. You ate an incredible amount of dead dead cap intentionally because you wanted to take your medicine in one season and get to kind of reopening the Bills' competitive window. 64.2. And in the process of reopening the window, you might have just blown it wide open again. Because the Bills are currently mopping up second-rate NFL teams. And realistically, Chris, isn't that what it is to be an upper echelon football team? Yes. Like, it doesn't mean you go undefeated. No one's done it since, oh, did you see Mercury Morris died? Who is that? (laughs) I I believe he was part of the famed uh, undefeated Dolphins team. Wow. Yeah. Chris, there's only one team that ever went undefeated. So the idea that, oh, well, you're only dominant if you win all but one or two of your games. Eh, I prefer to gauge it on how do you make subpar to mediocre football teams look? If they're bad football teams, do you make them embarrassed? Like, do you embarrass their fans to wear their gear the following day? If you do, then you're probably a good football team. And in that way, the Buffalo Bills have proven they are still a good football team. And now that we're sitting here inexplicably at 3-0, I was bearish to start the season. I said that after the first six, they would be 3-3. And And yet, I'm standing on the precipice of something where if they win this game, Chris, I'm going to be in. I talked myself into being just kind of... "Eh." I'm on the fence, you know, just however the season goes, it goes, let the chips fall where they may. If you beat the Ravens on Sunday Night Football and you go 4-0, now you're in, aren't you? You're emotionally invested because it's like, oh, well, why can't we win a Super Bowl then? Yeah, we got our three road games coming up, Baltimore, Houston, and the Jets. This is going to really test how good Buffalo is going to be. It's interesting, too, when you think about the history of being 4-0. Like, there's teams that have started 3-0, and right? Like, there's that famous chart from that tracks from 1990 to 2013. Teams that started 3-0, and 75% chance to make the playoffs. Teams that make it to 4-0 and have an 83% shot at making the playoffs. And the difference is, is that the variance of what happens when you take your first loss is so much less. 
getting to 4 and 0 is a benchmark of a playoff football team. And I don't think it's Chris, I don't think it's an accident that the last few years under Sean McDermott, when you look at where the team has been, historically, by week six, seven, we're a four or five win football team. Because you're well coached, you have a star quarterback, and for the first time in a long time, our offense has balance and unpredictability to it. I don't know what the shelf life is for that, though. And realistically, I don't know that we've seen them go up against talents. Like this is that thing where they say, where they say strength of schedule sucks, right? The traditional strength of schedule metric is garbage because it doesn't take into account the fact that the Dolphins could just crater, that the Jaguars could have paid a ton of money for a front seven that never gets anywhere near Josh Allen. It doesn't make a lick of difference anywhere on the field in that game. So I guess. This is one of those games where philosophically, when you think about what the Ravens have been, you know they're going to be a well-coached team. You know they have a former MVP quarterback. You know that they have the they have skill players enough to really do a lot of heavy lifting on offense, and they're talented enough on defense to make your life miserable if they can get their shit together and if you can let if you allow them to get your number. I look at this and I say to myself, the Bills are on the precipice of sucking me in. I want to see it. I want to see it. If the one and two Ravens, like this game means a ton to them. They need this game to get their season back on track. And if it happens, they're going to be, they're they're going to be on Dream Street. I was listening to my guy, everybody's favorite, Colin Cowherd. And he talked about the, uh, you know, Buffalo beating Jacksonville. He's now at the point where Buffalo's broken my heart so many times over the last season, but I still have to be able to love again. You know, when you go through a breakup or a divorce, you got to find that ability to love again. And he's at that point now with the Bills. He talked about that on uh, Wednesday, it, which it's it's true. I mean, they've broken our hearts, you know, 13 seconds, not showing up against Cincinnati in the playoffs. And even made mention of that. Yeah, they might lose to to Kansas City in the playoffs again. But right now, they are on fire, and I love it. And he's taking the bait. He's diving back in with the Bills. (laughs) It's funny because that's how a lot of people feel, I think. I think a lot of people are where I was at, where it's just like, hey, we're just happy to be here. This is fun. We're going to see where the chips fall. Now everybody's energized because we go, wait a minute. Do you mean to tell me things could could be better? They could be better and more balanced than they were in the early goings of last season when we thought they were a Super Bowl contender? <gasps> Ooh, you mean to tell me that Matt Milano might come back in time for the playoffs? Ooh, you mean to tell me that our defense that had, didn't have household names on it and is, and is pr- prominently featuring multiple players from the University of Buffalo might actually be really, really good. I'm still trying to temper expectations because we all know under McDermott, I think it's going to happen again. There's going to be a stretch in between October and November. It's going to be a five-game stretch. We'll, We'll go three and two or maybe two and three. And... And that almost, you're gonna you're gonna definitely go off the rails at that point. Be, well, but we've seen it every year. There's a a four to five game stretch, lull. mid middle of the season. I in my head, I'm preparing myself for that to happen again. And that's why this game is so important. Can you get to four and zero? Because if you can get to four and zero, like back when it was a sixteen game season, you go, hey, I made it to the first quarter poll and I'm undefeated. You're already a shoe in for the playoffs, right? Unless you're the 93 Dolphins. What a bunch of jackasses. Start 7-2 <laughs> and two and miss the playoffs. With that said, I, I look at this game with trepidation because I go, it's going to be hard. It's going to be in hostile territory. I'm sure the NFL would love to you know, throw in a few makeup calls because they know they give them a rough ride in Kansas City with all of those horseshit penalties and then also non-calls down the stretch that may or may not have decided the game. If you come away with this one, 
it changes a lot of the conversation around this team and what it might be capable of, doesn't it? Yeah. So there's a lot riding on it. Luckily, we have a really intelligent guest to break it all down with us tonight. And so with that, we welcome our guest for the evening, Mr. Ken McCusick from Ravens Film Study, Film Study Ravens. How are you tonight, sir? And how are your Ravens doing? Life's good here. Uh, it got a lot better with the win against the Cowboys, even though they made us sweat a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but it was a uh, it was a a fun Sunday, and you know, for the first time this year, I really want to rewatch the games just for for pleasure, as opposed to to breaking them down. I, I don't know about you guys. The, the the process of watching film is highly cathartic for me after a loss. I I go through it, and and after I pick it apart, I can see kind of what happened, uh, what didn't go well, you know convince myself that some of the things that didn't go well are truly correctable and it doesn't feel as bad and, and this is i still believe a very good ravens football team and and uh, probably will make the playoffs they are currently the fate the betting favorite to win the afc north still despite the one and two start the three and oh by the steelers and so uh you know things are pretty good overall it's it's funny because i have a completely different track what i do is i like to cope for a loss i rewatch the game i rem- i try to build my talking points for our podcast But I also try to crystallize why I'm angry. I go, okay, who am I angry at? Because I have to park this emotion somewhere. (laughs) And and then once I find victim this week, yeah, who's gonna get? (laughs) Where do I park? Because I'm I I do a very good job of just compartmentalizing my emotions. The problem is they have to. I have to have a box to put it in. So I have to figure out who deserves the blame. And then once I think I've figured it out. I go and I I go through the process of putting together a podcast about it. And by the time I'm done, I feel better about it. Like, I almost feel like I've gotten it off my chest. And then I come in here, I have a couple bull- I have a couple of these golden bullets and I, everything's great afterwards. I feel like a new man. What's funny is, is that your, the stuff you guys do over with the film study is so, it's so in depth and it's smart and it's, I enjoy listening to it. I enjoy being a part of it when I, when I get to do crossover shows with you. And then I always feel bad because I, I feel like you're slumming it when you come over here and do this with us <laughs> because we, yeah, I don't want to say it's lowbrow humor, but it's, it's, but I think that some of these things that we feel about football, right? Like the rewatch is what's important. You go back and you rewatch it so that you can try to put some context into what you just saw, because if you don't, you're just a prisoner of the moment forever. That's just where you live and die. And I'm, I'm interested to know. How is the Ravens fan base taking the the start you guys have had so far to this season? They are in fire John Harbaugh mode. Oh, um, no. And and so, okay, so there's there's 75, 80% of the fan base doesn't really hate John Harbaugh, thinks he's a great football coach, understands how valuable he's been, and can actually point to things, although they don't make any attempt to when the Ravens have lost two games in a row. <laughs> uh, the, 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 they don't make any attempt to bring out what's good about John Harbaugh. And then the 20%, 25% of the people who just hate his guts are just all over him the rest of the time. And, and that I find incredibly unproductive. And Harbaugh has been uh, you know, a great coach for a long time, had tremendous success uh, uh, by any measure. I mean, one of the things that, that I think is great, and it, and it really pertains to this game, is Harbaugh can get a team ready for a football game any time of day or night. And and uh, they're twenty and three at home in primetime games. So that's one of the things you know Buffalo's facing this week coming to Baltimore for a Sunday night game. The Ravens really want more home primetime games. They've 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 been angry with the NFL for scheduling many more on the road. It seems like over the years, particularly in the division games Ooh. against Pittsburgh, um, uh, and and they they complained about it at one point and said, "Look, we want a home game against the Steelers in primetime." And part of that is you want a Thursday night game. OK, and and then Thursday night, a big advantage. Everybody yes. understands why they, they, they'd want to do that. But but even if you're playing on Monday night, it's also a, a, an advantage and it's been an advantage for the Ravens. Um, I think one of the things Harbaugh did last year was they came back from London and they decided not to take their bye week. Great management of the team because you lose the team. They scatter like cats and then you have to reherd them uh, all over Europe. There'd be guys going to Amsterdam and doing things you really don't want <laughs> no. um, for, for, no. for that week. But, but Harbaugh brought them all back. They played the next week, and, and he had them ready to play, and, and they won that game too. So um, it, it, he's he's been the master of that uh, over his uh, over his time in Baltimore. He, he, he manages the game well, I think. He's he's more aggressive than he used to be. That's something he's evolved in, and 
Um, it's but he is the he's the guy that every Ravens fans wants to blame everything, offense, defense, or special teams for. Um, on John Harbaugh particularly. I mean, they have an offensive coordinator. They have a defensive coordinator. They had a great defensive coordinator. They lost to being a head coach. Um, the other thing they blame Harbaugh for is not stepping aside for Mike McDonald. <laughs> but somehow it would have been a great move for, for, for the Ravens to, to get rid of Mike, to get rid of Harbaugh and have Mike McDonald sign for the contract to get the Seahawks. And that's been magnified with the Seahawks 3 0 start. So, yeah. You yeah. lose great coaches if you have a great coaching tree and a great way of hiring coaches. You can have great success on the field. You lose coaches. It's actually something you should aspire to yes. and not complain about. Well, and that's what's funny is when you look at the dynamic for uh, Sean McDermott on the other side of the fence. Now, Chris, I don't know anybody. And when I say anybody, I mean anybody who just irreverently screams fire the coach anytime something goes wrong that's completely out of the coach's control. I, I don't know these people. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> you do it all the time at the stadium. <laughs> all the time. And this is why I say the rewatch is important, Ken. You have to figure out where to actually park those emotions. So, do you guys sit together at the games? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. We have four season <laughs> tickets. In the end Very zone, good. upper upper level, the 200 section. My favorite is when people will hear me and Chris arguing during a game about something and they think <laughs> we're having like we're strangers having a fight. And I go, no, no, this is my buddy. I just hate him <laughs> right now. I just hate him. So I, I know what that dynamic feels like. We do as Bills fans. And I think some of us might feel that way. And I to, to your point, it is exacerbated by an underling kind of leaving and having success somewhere else. Because you look at it with through those fan eyes of why not me? This could be my life, even if that's not realistic, right? So when we talk about what drove some of the early season struggles, I mean, you have the – it's not like you're getting blown out of games. A, a tight loss at Kansas City that just – I feel like if the referees were <laughs> – if this was playing at a neutral site, maybe that game goes a different way. The comeback by Vegas, that one interested me. I was a little shocked to see that. And then the almost comeback by the Cowboys when you guys had boat raced them in the first half. It's a lot of close football, but there again, that's what it is. I mean, football in its core is a close game. There's very few blowouts. The Bills just blew out the Jaguars, but those are outliers in terms of what football is typically. You, know, you look at the Cardinals. No one would call the Cardinals world beaters, but at the same time, we went down to the wire with them week one. You know, we would be in, you know, if a couple things don't go our way the first two weeks, we might be in your boat. I don't know. The, the Bills of, uh, not the Bills, the Chiefs have won something like nine straight football games by the fewest points in NFL history for any straight nine games. <laughs> it's absurd, so. right? And I, it's almost as if they, like, there's almost a finger on the scale being like, yeah, almost. But almost, right? But you can't say that or else you're a winder. So with that, I look at this Ravens-Bills matchup, and I say these are two teams that are, first of all, it's full of vet. I, I want to say veterans, but new faces, but it's tent-pulled by veteran talent, veteran head coaches, head coaches with very high profiles for preparing their teams. This game is going to be fireworks. It's going to be an incredible lit litmus test for both teams. And there's a lot of opportunity here. For the Ravens, it feels like an opportunity to kind of reestablish yourself and kind of say, hey, look, see, we're still in the upper crust of the NFL, regardless of what you all want to say about us after the first two weeks. For the Bills, it's the idea, can we actually hold serve in someone else's house another opponent who is one of these teams, a blue blood, a team that you expect to be good every single season. Can we go into their house and get a game? I doubt it's going to be as convincingly as we've won lately. <laughs> so that's the thing. Like that's where does this all go? So I've got some questions for you. I want to kind of pick through the matchup with you. And I want to start on the offense. I mean, slow starts for the passing attack. You know, the rushing game has been there for you. Like last week, you know, two back to back losses, you guys came out and just punished the Cowboys with the rushing attack. And when I look through the numbers, I expect to see Derrick Henry doing well. And I expect to see Lamar Jackson putting up good rushing numbers. Not quite that. I mean, what he did Sunday was incredible. But then I look at the passing numbers and I say, Mark Andrews has no catches. And I, I watched him get his first target. 
late in the game in the fourth quarter. And then I, I just, I question what is the, like, is this a symptom of design? You know, I see that some of your tertiary wide receivers, you know, for the Buffalo Bills, we're utilizing our entire wide receiver room every single game where I think it, against Miami in week two, the Bills had 10 different players catch a pass. Last week, it was nine different players catch a pass. And then I look at the Ravens and I see that your wide receivers three through six are barely running routes. What's happening here? Okay. So <laughs> with, with first of all, with Andrews, because he's probably the biggest story here. So the first week, Kansas City made a very um, designed effort to take him away by double covering him play after play after play and bracketing him. Smart thing. They went to likely, caught nine and 12 balls and had a huge game of 117 yards or something. So no problem there. Uh, it, it was it was by design that that, that occurred um, against Las Vegas. I'm trying to think of, of what happened with Andrews in that game. But Andrews, I believe, still had more snaps than likely in week two, despite the fact that likely had really gone off in week one. By the way, there's a lot of people saying Isaiah likely is the tight end that will be staying with the Ravens next year and Mark Andrews will be cut for cap purposes so so it's a, it's a very big possibility yeah. so um uh the, the ravens have three guys who come due at the same time and you you, you kind of don't want to ride the older horse in that no. situation so so they've got likely who's who will be a young player coming up for free agency he'll be very costly to resign they've also got charlie kohler who is pretty good um good blocker gives you some other things he also is at the exact same year he comes due so they're gonna have to put some money at a tight end after the 2025 season. But in, in his third game, uh, Andrews was, was hardly on the field. He played like 25% of the snaps, I want yeah. to say, 28%. And, and that was largely because they wanted the bigger tight ends in for run blocking. Andrews is actually bigger than Likely. Likely is an unbelievably good run blocking tight end. If you can look at PFF, anything mm -hmm. you want, but just look at the film. He is absolutely um, forklifting people in level two. Okay. Uh, very, very impressive run blocker. Uh, he did not come with that pedigree, uh, you know, out of school at all. That was really the knock on him was was could he block at the NFL level? Uh, but he's been terrific. So, so you know, they've got a very talented tight end group. The fourth guy that we didn't even talk about is Patrick Ricard. Um, if you think about it, I, I already projected this was going to happen coming into the season. Is no one is going to be happy with their snap total if these guys stay healthy because. You got four guys who probably the absolute top end in which they can play is about 2.0 heavies per play. They actually played 2.15 this last week, but that means those four guys have to average 50% of snaps. Well, likely wants 75% of the snaps, and Andrew wants wants 75% of the snaps, and and Ricard wants 50% of the snaps or more. And Kolar doesn't want to be shut out, so he wants 25 to 30% of the snaps. You, you you don't have enough to go around. Mm -hmm. So you 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 have a uh, a group that's extremely talented. It's probably the the, the deepest uh, group in terms of talent that the Ravens have. I'm not gonna lie to you. So there's a comedian Shane Gillis who goes on the Joe Rogan podcast and gets hammered and yells about put on Mike Allstott tape. That's a thing I do in my basement, except I do it with Patrick Ricard videos on YouTube. Patrick Ricard has been one of my favorite football players for a while because he plays that old school throwback style of fullback in an era where that doesn't exist for most franchises. He's to be that big and that fast and that powerful is just an incredible thing. And I love the fact that the Ravens have weaponized that over the years. He's been amazing to watch. I, he actually scares me a little bit about this matchup. We know that they're going to rush the ball and that they're going to rush the ball effectively. That is a known fa because and it's an interesting dynamic, right? The Bills have done a good job hemming in Derrick Henry historically. They've done a good job of kind of keeping Lamar Jackson's legs in check throughout the years that Sean McDermott's been playing the Ravens. They've never had to contend with them both at the same time. And so in that way, I expect your rushing attack to flourish or at least to do well in this matchup and do a lot to keep you in the ball game. The question is, when I look at the passing attack, I mean, there's three players with double digit targets, tight ends, you know, and the, the wide receiver room really is kind of underutilized. It almost feels like in terms of the passing attack, where do you expect the Baltimore Ravens when they do pass? Because we talked about it on your show that we recorded earlier they just beat the Cowboys while only attempting 15 passes. Mm -hmm. 
when they do throw the ball, where is it that you expect them to try to attack a defense like Buffalo's? Yeah, so the, uh, 156 of the 182 yards against Dallas. It was an incredibly efficient per play uh, passing attack. Um, so they had you know, 12 yards per, per attempt or whatever. Um, they're the, uh, 156 came to on five receptions and none of those were the primary receivers. So there was two, two by Hill, one by Derrick Henry, one to Aguilar, who was, got 56 yards on a lot of yak and one to Kolar, who got 30 yards with a, with a, a lot of yak. The ball was basically caught at the line of scrimmage. So I, I don't think it'll be something different. What I, what I basically said coming out of that game is, the next team who plays us knows nothing about our offense if this is the only game they look at. It. Yep. So, so they, they, they won't know anything about what we're trying to do. I think that the, the, the key thing for the Ravens will be to do what I thought they would try and do against Dallas. Dallas, uh, you know, basically is extremely exploitable in the middle of the field. And they have guys who, um, you know, if you want to go play action against them, I think you can get them to read downhill on the Lamar Henry mesh point. And when I say that, by the way, they don't actually have to go into the mesh mm-hmm. for, 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 to, for people to have to respect that it might happen. Anytime that but Derrick Henry lines up at a sidecar or at a pistol even, and he crosses Lavar Jackson's position on the field, that creates a, a, a difficulty for linebackers in reading the play and for everybody, frankly, for, for edge players and, and, and for linebackers. Yep. If, if Lamar gets the ball, he, he, you know, certainly can take off and, and the linebacker better not be out of position. The edge player better not guess wrong. Yep. Um, under those circumstances, but that's just the run element of it. The other thing it does is it freezes those linebackers closer to the line of scrimmage and opens up play action between level two and three, like no weapon in the NFL. So the, 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 the guys the Ravens have to exploit that are tremendous football players in, in their, their tight end group in, in Andrews and likely, um, Zay Flowers can do some of it because he finds space and zone extremely well. Uh, I think that, uh, Aguilar has been a guy who, uh, Jackson is really, used as an extended play target, which is they, they have guys who have that trust with Jackson. That's a really good thing because he needs more of them. It needs to not just be Mark Andrews. Um, and and uh, you know, he, they just have they have a lot of weapons right now. And I can say this in, in all the years of being a Ravens fan, I've been a season ticket holder since their very first season. Um, there, there has been no time when I've been as happy with their skill position players as I am right now, including a pretty damn good offense when they first got to Baltimore in 1996. That's interesting to me when you talk about the mesh point and just the uh, the pressure it puts on your defense, because realistically, you're right. What you're doing is because football at its core, when it, when you're doing it, like having played just as a little kid, it's trusting what you see and reacting in real time. And the problem is when you have to stop and think. And the second you stop and think about what you're seeing, especially when those other players are fast, like the speed that you guys have at your disposal. That's where disasters happen. <laughs> it's because you you get caught thinking and not acting. So it, it will be interesting to see how we combat that aspect of your offense, because you don't need special skill players when the scheme and the talents that you have behind the line of scrimmage pre-snap dictate what happens after the snack and how much attention they draw from everybody else. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that I did run in, run across in the run up to this show is just the injury report. How much does what is currently going on in your offensive line do you think going to play a role in their ability to execute the things you just talked about? Yeah, I'm first of all, the offensive line is the biggest question on the entire team. An enormous problem. It's the it's the only real weakness of a serious nature that the team has on either side of the ball. But it's three out of five new positions and and uh, two rookies at guard who haven't looked good. Uh, Falele played well in the last game um, as a Blocker in level two, doing some very specific things in the run game that I, that I think were good. One of the nice like moments after the game was Derrick Henry got a game ball, uh, gave his little speech after the game, and then he apparently jumped into the arms of Daniel Faolele, who's six eight and three seventy or so. <laughs> um, and and uh, uh, that just that's a that's a great moment for Daniel to hopefully boost his confidence. Find his life. Yeah, boost his confidence. Yeah. There it was. Now he's got a hip injury, by the way. Hopefully not suffered on that exact I was going to say, hopefully it wasn't uh, catching yeah. Derek. <laughs> but he, he did, uh, he did, he uh, played through, uh, sorry, he, he practiced today uh, full despite that hip injury. But they've got injuries everywhere else. Amazingly, Ronnie Stanley is not the guy who's injured, but Tyler Linderbaum's on the injury report. McCary is on the injury report. Um, and Voorhees is on the injury report. So, 
and 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 of course the the, the hip injury with full practice was noted for uh, for Falele. So uh, it's it's a it's a team that that's it, it has severe questions. One of the reasons people want John Harbaugh fired, uh, you know, the small vocal minority that does is that he won't insert Ben Cleveland in at right guard for Falele. And uh, Cleveland has been a guy who's played well when he's been on the field, but has a history of um, not being in Harbaugh's graces for various reasons. He showed up fat after he got married for his first for his second season, failed the conditioning test, which is kind of notorious yeah. around the NFL that Ravens do. And then he, he never regained the trust of Harbaugh since. Uh, they listed him. This is something the Ravens do punitively, by the way. They listed him that entire season at 370 pounds. It's probably because he weighed in at that. And so they said, you know, you're not getting away with this. Everybody's going to know what you weighed coming in here. And, and I'm sure he lost weight. Um, and, and they went down. But, but punitively, they said, you know, you're going to live with that weight the, the, the whole year. Our moniker and, is that we are the pettiest Bills podcast. I love that. I absolutely yeah. love that practice. Well, take, take a look at Ben Cleveland now. I mean, the, the, if anything, the problem is he doesn't have enough weight in his in his thighs and glutes. He is he's built like an Adonis. I mean, he's, he's a, but most of his weight is up here, literally in his shoulders and and pecs. And and there's he's got a relatively thin waist for his kind of a, a a kind of a build. He's you know he's six six three fifty three fifty five maybe um, at this point. But he's just he's built like. You know, much more vertically than you expect a, a player with that size to be. So, one last question before we kind of flip to the other side of the ball. One thing I noticed when I was looking over stats and I was looking at different reception charts and things of the nature, I find that, you know, here we are talking about how, hey, they have tight ends. So, they don't utilize a lot of the wide receivers. Like the, you have Nelson Aguilar, who's got a handful of targets. And then pretty much the rest of the guys in the wide receiver depth chart are, you know, Rashad Bateman. Rashad Bateman's involved. Outside of those three, there's no other ancillary involvement from five, six on down the line to the rest of the wide receiver core. They're mostly special teamers. I look at Zay Flowers and I go, you're probably the, not probably, you are the most naturally talented Ravens wide receiver. No pass attempts beyond 20 yards this season. Not a single target on the field. Now, what is, is that a product of the offensive line? Or is that a conscious decision they've made not to feature him in that facet of the game? It, it, it's returning to a mistake that they had the first half of last year. I, I really hate the usage. I talk about it all the time on my pod. But um, th they tried to bring in multiple players who could fill a gadget role. And you, so they use Flowers for a lot of jet motion, a lot of wide receiver screens and whatnot. The guy they have is the ex-Bill Deontay Hardy um, <laughs> that could be in that role. He's played five yeah. offensive snaps this season. So, you know, that's that's very frustrating. He's he was hurt a little bit of camp, but but you know, they've got to use him a little more in the offensive scheme, you know, relative to what he is. They use Hill a ton in that role, but Hill is already taking half the snaps at running back, and there's no third back on this team. They've they've had uh, practice squad elevations who have a total of zero snaps played at running back in two wow. in three weeks. Okay. Um and so they're waiting on Keaton Mitchell to come back, who had the greatest year ever by a running back in forty plus carries last year. Uh, was absolutely astounding, incredible success rate of over 68% um, and uh, eight over eight yards a carry. It's, it's an astounding year th that, that he had. Fantastic speed player, works very well in this team, forces all sorts of missed tackles, mostly by elusiveness, but he also was a deceptively powerful runner. He's, he, he just tweeted recently that he's back up to 20 miles an hour. You never know with players because they'll tend to exaggerate that kind of crap. No. Um, <laughs> No, yeah. players, players lie. Yeah, Von like Mil somebody's weight. Yeah. Yes, Von, yes, like Von, that. Von Miller telling everybody, oh, no, I'm back, guys. I'm ready. I'm going to be ready for week one. And then he goes on pup. And it's like, dude, what are you talking about? Shakir in his six feet. Yeah, exactly. Khalil Shakir being six feet tall. It's one of the worst. There's lies. There's damn lies. And there's Khalil yeah. Shakir being six feet tall. <laughs> so. I hear what you say, and also as someone who thought they stole a star running back in free agency and fantasy football, yeah, no, I remember the loss of Keaton Mitchell. Like that was that was a, that sucked. What I'll say is this: I just don't love some of the things I see from the Ravens' offense in that regard, where it's like, hey, here's this super talented player, and you're not putting him in the role. And the same thing with Deontay Hardy. You talk about Deontay Hardy. When we brought him in, we thought we were getting like a, a Tyreek Hill light, 
like the like the crystal light version of t- like someone who could do some of the things that Tyreek Hill did. And we were all excited about what he could do for our offense. And then all they did was run nine routes with him. And then eventually he never played on offense. <laughs> so is it, here's the question, though. If it happened on two teams and you see this thing happening that I also now have familiarity with, is it our teams or is it just the player? I, I guess it could be the player, you know, to be fair about it. I, I was at camp the whole summer, of course. I, I Deontay Hardy wasn't used in a gadget play role there to any great degree. I mean, okay. they, they, I don't know if we maybe see less of the jet motion type plays in 11 on 11 plays during the summer, or if more of that gets installed on walkthroughs and they see it yeah. there. Because they, there's no reason to show it when fans are around because sure. you don't know who the fans are. You sure. don't know who the fans are. And, and I, I just, the, the frustration and, and what, the, how they did fix it last year in the second half, which is much more productive. They made flowers into more of a deep threat and took him out of the gadget play role when they had Mitchell and they had others to take on that responsibility. As soon as that can happen, uh, it can't be soon enough for me. <laughs> so that's an interesting thing to monitor is that just the usage of some of your best talent seems like it's not where it should be for this offense to really be at its most dangerous. Now, flipping sides of the football, if we talk about the defense, you guys have had, and and when I say you guys, first of all, I'm a Ray Lewis fan, like Mm -hmm. Stan. And then I dated a girl for four years who was a very big Ravens fan. I I remember she and I celebrating. In fact, Chris and I met the, like the night that we met, we met at a bar called Tony Rome's here in Western New York. And it was the night that the Ravens were playing the Broncos in the playoffs. And Joe Flacco hits Jacoby Brissett for this ridiculous. Jacoby, yeah. Jaco- oh, Jacoby, Jacoby Jones. Jacoby Brissett. Jesus, he's a quarterback for the Patriots. He hits Jacoby Jones. And I lose my I, I lose my mind. I throw a chair. And Chris has just met me for the first time. You were upset about it? Oh, no. I was ecstatic. I'm okay. whipping. For, and there's, mind you, this bar is that was half. An imp- that was an improbable play. And this, yeah. and mind you, this bar is only half full. There's maybe 20 people in the room at this point. And everyone's got eyes on me like, who is this lunatic? I go, did you just see the foot? The Ravens, yes, because they're going to go win another one. And Ray Lewis is going to get a trophy and it's going to be awesome and everything's going to be great. And so that was the night I met Chris, just me celebrating the Ravens beating the Broncos. And so it's, I have a, I have a really profound love for the way that the, your franchise has approached playing stout defense and then doing it differently year over year, kind of massaging their approach, but always being relatively solid. And then we come into this season and I watch the fact that your secondary's gotten a little bit beat up this year by some people. And I could understand some of it, like if you're talking about Dak Prescott and the Cowboys passing game, they've invested a lot of resources in being able to move the ball on offense. I mean, it, I shouldn't say invested. Jerry Jones, it literally, I think they had to pull some of his teeth in order to get him to pay C.D. Lamb. <laughs> but that game, they found a way to move the ball through the air, find space to operate, and make a comeback. When I see Gardner Minshew doing it, though, that's when I question and I go, all right, is this schematically broken? What's happening here? Can you break that down based on your film study? Yeah, I'd say you know, one of the real questions is is what's happened with Zach Orr. And they also, the Ravens also lost Denard Wilson to be the defensive coordinator of the, uh, of the uh, Titans. Oh, okay. Titans, right. Yeah, but McDaniel was the head, was the defensive coordinator, and he left to, the, to be the head coach of the Seahawks. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's it, there's a lot of losses, you know, c- coming out of the uh, the defensive coaching ranks, and or had been a McDaniel disciple, uh, McDonald disciple. Sorry, the last couple of years, and uh, you know, we thought things would be in some ways similar. One way is that they've one way that they've had difficulty being similar is in in game adjustment, and that's where McDonald was very good. And and made made uh, uh, changes very quickly. Through two weeks, we didn't see really good changes out of Orr. Um, and I, in each game, it was something a little bit different. The second game was a big one of not being able to deal with Devontae Adams and Brock Bowers when they were the only two weapons that Minshew had. And you just got to do something differently to rotate a safety and take away routes and whatnot. Or may have been, you know, we've we've done some 
conjecture on my show i'll say about what, what reasons why he wouldn't try and do it but he didn't try and um uh bring a safety down to rob and take routes away in the way that that you know ravens teams have done and bill's sure. teams frankly have done with their talent yep. you know o- over the years but but the other the other thing week one they let themselves get consistently beaten by these pick and rub routes where mahomes was able to match up an individual wide receiver, often Rasheed Rice, on a linebacker. And it's a tremendous mismatch. Roquan Smith is a good coverage linebacker, but he's no match for that. Malik Harrison shouldn't have been on the field after they saw him mess one uh, coverage up. And Trenton Simpson is a young guy who, who actually got his hands on the football twice in that game, but still is someone you could take advantage of. And Mahomes, obviously, a very accurate quarterback and a guy who who did a great job of doing that. I, I, one of the guests on my show suggested the best way to deal with that would have been to drop a edge rusher out and disrupt the bunch directly with physical contact at the line of scrimmage and which would have been a great idea and, but, uh, and that's the type of stuff where you go okay so that would have required you to make an adjustment to what you were seeing mm-hmm. and by all accounts your coordinator's not really he's not changing things on the fly in real time well two two weeks in a row that was definitely true the third week um the middle of the game, all of a sudden, they went to the dime defense against the uh, Cowboys and ended up playing 34 out of 70 snaps out of dime. Okay. Uh, what that meant, and this is why I think it's such a good sign for Orr, big-time tendency breaker. Now, for those who don't know who Zach Orr was, he was an inside linebacker, played for the Ravens uh, during his playing days, was a very good three-down will. Now, three-down wills, like Matt Milano, for example, are um, a rare bird. They are a luxury to have because I don't think you should ever pay more than one inside linebacker. Um, So your second inside linebacker, if you're paying him, uh, you really want to get value out of him. Even if you don't, and Orr was on his first contract with the with the Ravens, um, it's it's really special when he can be on the on the field for three downs. And coming in as a defensive coordinator and coming off you know years with McDonald where they had used a committed nickel system, I expected them to stay with the nickel on third down. And all of a sudden, week three, they've got 34 dime snaps. They've got one quarter snap in there. And it, just okay. incredible that they would go to six and seven defensive backs almost half the time. And that's the type of thing where it's going to be interesting to see how they decide to try to prevent this Bills offense that's been, it's been steamrolling every team it's played. You know, we had the, I say this, we played th- two and a half of the best football games anybody's ever seen this season. And, it's weird because it took both coordinators. It was their first opportunity and they floundered a little bit. So for the opening half against Arizona, it took them a minute to kind of see what was happening, see what the opponent was doing, find the right adjustments. And the second that it clicked, we took that game over and then it was hang on for dear life down the stretch and see if we can. I mean, we were down 17, three and you come back and you win it by six points. That's a victory. Then you go on the next week and you embarrass the Dolphins and then you embarrass the Jaguars and they may not be much as football teams, but what you saw was tendency breaking. And I'm happy you use that term because through two weeks we were primarily running and we were using the run to set up some things in the flats and to kind of work the intermediate areas. And then in this game, we came out and we abandoned the run and used the passing game as an extension of it and said, Hey, We'll get running backs in the flats or we're going to send running backs on passing routes downfield because we don't think you can. We're going to line up, motion them out, and now you have to worry about how to defend that. And it just put everybody on roller skates. That's what good coordinators do. So it's interesting seeing that he maybe Zach Orr is finding his stride in that regard. And the Bills against a dime defense. I'd be interested to see what that looks like, especially played the way we know the the Ravens traditionally are coached and coached well. The, they bring in players with a good pedigree. Jalen Armour Davis, I'm a huge Alabama fan. So seeing him go to your team, what was his injury? He were, are we going to see him this week? Which one? I mean, he's been injured <laughs> his whole freaking career. He's, yes, he's hardly he gotten is. on the field. Um, it, uh, I'm not a big Jalen Armour Davis fan, by the way. Just, just, just to be clear, It's okay. I'm, he's the Ravens' fourth cornerback right now behind uh, the big two and Wiggins. Uh, and now when you really talk, when you include the slot, our Darius Washington has taken over this team as far as he's, he's going to Wally Pip anybody else who might have thought they had a claim to that position, including a Mallette, Humphrey, uh, Kyle Hamilton really moved to dime because in part what, what 
with Kyle Hamilton moving to dime, that Washington was incredibly successful in the second half of that game. Even though it gave up the touchdown, by the way, that got him within three. He was all around the football, hands on the football, disrupting plays, taking you know, taking C.D. Lamb out, uh, stripping him. I, it's just, he, had, he had a, a fantastic football game. But anyway, the, 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 the outside guys, I mean, if Armour Davis is your last quarterback, no, cornerback, no problem. Uh, but you can't count on him to be healthy, and he's been injured again this year. Uh, got injured in the in the game last week. Um, Wiggins is a better cornerback, even though Wiggins has some significant problems. And uh, Armand Davis basically has hardly played any football. Hardly played yeah. at Alabama. Hardly has played with the Ravens in now three seasons. Um, couldn't even get on the field for the preseason more than I think it's two games, two preseason games, or maybe only one that he's played um, in 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 three years. Now maybe two. So it's 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 <laughs> the, the the dearth of football that that guy has played is remarkable. <laughs> and if you watch him play during the during the summer, the thing that continues to stand out is the guy just cannot find the football in the air. So he yeah. can't. It, it, we're, we're going a little long on one guy, but he, oh, he yeah. doesn't know how to put his hand on the receiver to maintain track of him and and check back for the football. He cannot do that. So now, so, the, so, so Wiggins has supplanted him in mm -hmm. this. Now this is where I'm I'm looking for your opinion on things you as a Ravens fan who's done the study you've done on your own players, where are some of the weaknesses in this secondary that you're nervous about ahead of this Bills game? So, so right now, which is really surprising this is the case, Marcus Williams has not played as well as he did in his first two years with the Ravens, and, and he was hurt a lot, but he also was a guy who on a per-snap basis had tremendous productivity. Uh, he was out of position for one of the touchdowns that went to Tolbert in the Dallas game that made it 28-18. And there was some post-snap emotion. She catch some of it on camera. It's mm -hmm. one thing I really look for in film study is to see who who says what the hell you were doing after the play and at who, yeah. because that will that will tell you a, a, a lot of things. But beyond that, um, uh, the strong safety position is fairly weak. Um, it's got uh, uh, Eddie Jackson is the guy who plays the split field when Hamilton is up in the slot, and obviously the position is fine when Hamilton's back deep, but uh, but when he's in when he's in in the slot, that's uh, uh sorry when he's at at the uh, split field safe, split safety, he hasn't really been good. I think he's given up ten yards per target the last four seasons combined. It's been a long time since he was good in his first two years in the league. Um, I didn't like the acquisition at all. I thought there were other better split field opportunities um, that, that that the Ravens could have had. He hasn't really impressed to date, and that is one of the weaknesses where where if you want to find a, a way. Um, to, to take advantage of the Ravens on defense, I think that would probably be it. Um, Simpson has played terrific um, when he's when he's been on the field, and I think they found the limited role for him as a weak side linebacker. So I don't really look at that as a weakness. Mm -hmm. Roquan, if you look at his coverage problems, it's really been a matter of he's the only guy they can pick on. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm not. I would be concerned about that. C.J. Mosley kind of had the same rap in his years with the Ravens. He's great, great coverage linebacker. Mm -hmm. So I, no. I, I don't really have an issue. It's 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 a very solid, very stout defensive team, and um, they've they've proven the ability to stop the run with the nickel. Um, sorry, with yeah, uh, yeah, with the nickel without going to base personnel. Yep. Uh, which is that's usually a, a good formula for winning football. And that's why I think that the Bills and the Ravens are always such a fun matchup, right? Well, like we've met each other now multiple times, including games in the playoffs. And with that in mind. Like, that's how you breed familiarity. It's those postseason things. And when you watch the two teams kind of fight to a, almost a stalemate the way that we were doing, it shows you how those coaches have kind of wired some of the same DNA into their teams. And that's why I love this game. And I'm scared of it at the same time. Well, me too. I, I, I wouldn't have shocked me if I saw that the Bills were a three point favorite coming into this. I think it's 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 close, right? One one and a half right now. I think it's a. I think I saw two and a half a couple of days ago. It might have moved since then. Mm -hmm. Maybe with the I offensive guess. line injury news, maybe they're kind of shaving some points. Baltimore minus two and a half. Okay, so okay. it's still a two and a half. And so in that way, I I do think that this is kind of a coin flip in terms of who comes out and can make the right adjustments because I think that this. When you talk about the talents at quarterback, when you talk about the talents at coach, when you talk about the talents at coordinator, and then you look at what they have on the field to work with, these are two teams that it is just a rock, paper, scissors match over <laughs> who's going to consistently come out on top. And I think it's the team that can make the right, the right adjustments 
around the late second quarter that's going to win this game. I really do. I, I believe you're going to see about a quarter and a half of them feeling each other out, knowing this about each other as coaches. And I think that by the second half, we're going to know what this game is. And we're going to see each team's hand. Fair to say that if the Bills win this game, first of all, they're they're right there with the Chiefs in terms of control of the AFC. That that game, th- those teams play later this year, right? I assume because they're both first place teams. So we always end up playing them. <laughs> yeah. So so that that likely, if if the if the Ravens lose this game, that likely is for the for one seed in the AFC. That that game. Um, if the Ravens lose this game, I don't think they're out of it in any, not, not in the North, no. not in terms of the playoffs, not anything. It'll be, no. it'll be unfortunate to, to, to lose a home game like this, but it, but it wouldn't be the end of the world. If they win it, they're right back in there for, for, uh, yes. uh you know, possibility of a one or a two. Season. And that's the thing. This game has so many, you know, we'll kind of open the show talking about this idea of implications and what it means and how, even though it's only week four, this game feels huge. And it's because there's so many long reaching implications of what this matchup is for both teams right now in the moment and also what it looks like for the future. I'm excited. I wish it was tomorrow. Unfortunately, we have to wait until eight o'clock on Sunday and I have to try not to drink too many of these in <laughs> advance of kickoff because it's going to be a long night. Ken, you are, as always, one of our most intelligent guests. You're one of our most well-spoken guests. And I don't mind saying that if the rest of them hear it, because guess what, guys? You're not as smart as Ken. Ken, where can everybody find your work, and where can they follow you over at the uh, Film Study there? Okay, appreciate it. I'm at Film Study Ravens on Twitter. The, the website that I use is filmstudybaltimore.com. What you might want to go there is to look at offensive line scoring. I do block-by-block block scoring, particularly if you're a Bills fan. You want to go in, you want to see what Daniel Falele or or – uh, Andrew Voorhees did this last week. It's it's all out there for you. Um, and what else is there? Yeah, the, the podcast is Film Study, Baltimore Ravens Talk on all the podcast platforms. Ken McCusick on Twitter at Film Study Ravens, Film Study Baltimore, the podcast. Uh, former show made at Blue Wire. Ken's an all around great guy. Everybody that listens to his show comes on over for whenever we have him on. He, of any guests we have on, Ken McCusick, biggest uptick in our downloads. Which he's, is hilarious. He's a smart guy. Because he's, he's He smart. shouldn't be hanging around us. Oh, yeah. No, I, I feel like being in the same room with us lowers his IQ like a couple points. Well, yeah, you. <laughs> uh, so that brings us, Chris, to this week's Keys to Victory. Wow, it's a lot of keys. Bigger the keychain, more powerful the man. I've got a couple. I'll run, I'll run you through them fast. The Bills have opened each of their last two games with very aggressive opening possessions. And I think that that's going to be important. I think aggression on offense. Chris, I don't expect them to suddenly turn into a different football team just because we went to somebody else's house. With that said, I think there may also be some trepidation now because we've gotten to see Mc, a side of McDermott where he's allowing our offensive coordinator to go for it in positions where you would never expect him to allow a coordinator to go for it on fourth and three from our own, from the other team's 45, right? What I think it is, is McDermott evolving as a head coach. Sure. And trusting his quarterback. Hey, it's fourth and one, fourth and two, fourth and three. And plus Joe Brady going, no, I've got to play. Yeah. We're going to get it done. You saw that against Miami, James Cook touchdown, and you saw it on Monday Multiple night times against on Monday Jacksonville. Night. So with that in mind, I think that that aggression is going to be necessary in this game. There was gambles made against what they and we perceived correctly to be lesser talents on defense that could be easily manipulated. And ultimately, <sighs> These were teams that we felt like we could keep pace with or better on offense. The way that the Ravens are going to attack us is they are going to hammer us with unorthodox rushing style. They're going to use a fullback who's a machine and they're going to try to hammer us to pieces. I have no doubt in my mind that this game, if the Ravens win, we're going to go back and look at the box score. We're going to see that they threw the ball 19 times. And you're going to lament all of the times where just eye candy got your linebackers, pulled them out of position, and they ran it up the middle, or they ran it off tackle away from you. 
and your safeties had to rally, but it was too late because they just lean on you with that rushing attack. And it's one yard and then it's seven yards. And then you get them at the line on first down and then they break off six. And then it's a dump off to Julian Hill and he's up the sideline and they've got another first down and they just work it down on you using the rushing attack, not taking a lot of chances. One of the more interesting dynamics about the Ravens, when you look at their performance this season, they're almost dead nuts even in terms of turnovers for and against on defense and offense. Last week was the first time that the offense didn't commit a turnover in the game, and their defense has gotten one turnover in every game. So because they won the turnover margin, they won the game. Chris, one more bad play by, like, that's how close the Ravens are kind of living to the edge of what is and what isn't acceptable in the NFL. I think that you have to be aggressive on offense and you have to be willing to push the envelope and say, I need that upper hand, not only to take them out of a run first mentality, force them to throw the ball a little bit more. But then also what that does is it puts more pressure on every possession they have. The clock becomes your enemy and also you have no choice but to try to take chances of your own. I I don't think the Cowboys did enough of that. And then down the stretch, the second half became the Cowboys just selling out to stop the run. The, The Ravens just failing to connect on passes, punting the football, and then at the end of things, you have a tight football game. Like if I look at the drive chart, Chris, from the last game for the Ravens, in the after the second quarter, this, this was their third. This was their second half, Chris. They scored a touchdown in the third quarter to take a bigger lead. From there, it was a punt, a missed field goal, a punt, and then they ran seven plays and ran the clock out. But the game was never promised. They had to go under the two minute warning with the concept being if the if the Cowboys get a stop. They're going to get the ball back, and they've scored three straight touchdown drives. They're probably going to go down and score and win the game. It's Their balls are always this close to the bandsaw, and I think that when they go into that shell of just let's play conservative, that's to their detriment. The Bills have to be aggressive and force them to also be aggressive. Let's make them, because they don't have skill po- position players like we do levels of them to rely on and in that way i think that if we can make them go to those you know hey make them match our regression as we're out there attacking them with fourth string wide receivers fit you know our fifth wide receiver on the depth chart mac collins is out here making plays or keon coleman's out here making plays hey also by the way we're throwing the ball to ray davis and uh james cook you do enough of this and you score and you put the pressure like you have to be Chris. I, I, I expect them to go forward on fourth down at least once in the first two possessions. Yeah. If you can do that, it will set the table for you to put the pressure on the Ravens that I don't know. They I don't know they can match because they don't have the skill position talent to the offensive coordinating to really get to that point. And I think that that's where we can kind of give ourselves a leg up in this. Not even scoring early, just putting the pressure on them, even if it comes down to a possession battle of, hey, field position. We have more weapons than you. We have, we're deeper and you can put dime on the field. Fine. We've got five guys that we trust that one of them can make a play and we can get the ball to him. That's more of a Brady thing than a, you know, depth of talent thing, but I'll take it. And I think that using that aggressively is going to be one of the keys to us winning the game, using the depth of the chart, getting down there, making those fourth and fourth and one calls, fourth and two calls. Don't be scared. Go for the jugular early, because if we can put them on their heels, it pays dividends on down the line. On defense. Right. Like We know game script is important. Look at this offensive line, Chris. They're in tatters. You have to find a way, and I know it seems counterintuitive when you're playing a team with linebackers, or I mean tight ends, the way they do, that might match up against our linebackers in ways you don't like. I think they still have to be aggressive on that side of the football. 
you have to be willing to drop a hey cycle down from too high safety into a single high look post snap, knowing they're probably running it anyway. Remember all those run blitzes we saw from uh, from Babich in that Miami game? Yeah. Some of them were poorly timed. But this is a game where you need to have that mentality of, hey, I know they're not going to throw the ball around on me. Why? Because my cornerbacks aren't going to allow it. Because their talent isn't built that way. Because they're not trying to push the ball down the field. Then I shouldn't be shy about sending a linebacker on a run blitz and cycling a safety down into the box because realistically, that's where they're going anyway. I don't think the the Ravens are going to reinvent themselves overnight when they have injuries on their offensive line, are they? I have no idea. I know you don't. <laughs> I'm asking. The, 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 that's called a rhetorical question, Chris. Yeah. Plus, I wasn't listening. Do you know how to spell rhetorical? It's probably an R-H. <laughs> You're that smarter than you look. Sounds like an R-H. I genuinely believe that it's going to take aggression. It's going to take linebacker blitzing, specifically linebacker run blitzes in order to get this thing to a place where we can force stoppages, where we can. I'm not worried about our cornerbacks against their skill players. I don't think they have much. And I think that the tight ends that they do have, they misuse. I believe that all it takes is one of those one or two of those offensive linemen to miss some time. They will commit more protection to the line rather than risk sending them out on routes. And in that way, I believe that we will have an advantage in that way and we should lean on it. I want to see I want to see an aggressive front seven plan from Babich that includes linebacker blitzes, probably Dorian Williams, just because do you trust Balin Spector to kind of know what's in front of him, blitz, get to the right hole? <laughs> I mean, I think I could trust Balin Spector against uh Miami because they're soft. Jacksonville because they're soft. Well, Baltimore, that's a whole like this is a the way, seasoned they, team. Yeah, see, they've been seasoned. They're well coached throughout their entire franchise. They're buttoned up, top down, and they draft the correct players. I don't know if I can trust Specter here. And this is my last point. Don't get out coached. Ravens fans may not have a very high opinion of John Harbaugh right now, but John Harbaugh has made that franchise relevant, wouldn't you say, Chris? Yeah. I mean, he's he's kept them in contention year in and year out. If they're not in the playoffs, they're right on the cusp every single season. Then he gets Lamar Jackson and he goes, oh, okay, we're a playoff team every year now by default because I have a great quarterback. How many head coaches do you think they've had? Not many. I remember Brian Billick. Billick was won a Super Bowl with them. That was the 2000 defense with Ed Reed and Ray Lewis. It was the best defense of all time. Ted, Fuck the 85 Ted Bears. Ted Marchabroda, Brian Billick, and John Harbaugh. That's, That's it. it. They've had three. Co- they're like the Steelers. Yeah. That's why them and the Steelers are so fun to watch because they have the same DNA just in different cities. I do like it was Marcia Broda first. Yeah, God. Marcia Broda. It's hilarious. <laughs> so. In this way, I firmly believe that we have a leg up in terms of coordinator talent. Hopefully, Sean McDermott lets them continue to be who they are. Don't get gun shy now. Now is the time. And this is going to be another litmus test for who is Sean McDermott. You said earlier in the opening of the show, you feel like he's grown. or He's learned some things. I'll tell you this. If he has truly grown, then he's going to let his guys continue to do what they do. Be aggressive. Take chances. Make wild plays. Don't turtle like you normally do when the lights are bright and you're going up against a really good. You mean like you at Denny's? Yes, like me outside of Denny's. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome callback. Don't do that, Sean. Let the boys, like Chris, let the boy watch. (laughs) Let the boys call a game. And you just be there to oversee, give advice. Obviously, stop lunacy when you see it. But, you know, if he wants to call a quarterback draw on fourth and four, you tell him no. But otherwise, 
let these guys do what they've been doing and let's see if it works against an upper crust team, a blue blood. And if it does, and if they can continue to hold serve as your coordinators, whether we win by an inch or a mile, you will have known that Sean McDermott not only has turned over a new leaf, but might have found gold in both of these guys that could turn this season from just, hey, let's get over the dead cap to this could be something special. I can't wait to see it play out. I hate that I got to wait until 830 to see it happen. But for tonight, we got to get the hell out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. And this has been your week four preview.